All right, enough. We get it. We're thanking God for an awesome new house. For those of you who are meeting new people, blessed be the Lord. Talk to them after. You boys got a message. Let's go. Come on. Let's go. Come on. Go ahead, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Take a seat for me. So uh, we've been going through the book of Genesis, passage by passage, walking through it from January all the way until today. The last two messages were actually focused in on a family from Isaac and Rebecca. You see, if you remember, if you've been with us, they have a set of twins. The oldest is Esau, the youngest is Jacob. So this family culturally received blessings as brothers. Uh, two chapters ago, Esau, the oldest brother, ends up giving away his cultural birthright. Now stick with me, because we're going to go context, then we're going to pray, and then get into the message. He gives away his cultural birthright as the firstborn son to his younger sibling, Jacob. Uh, this was the right to land. This was a promise that his future families would flourish. And then the best out of all of them is that the Messiah would come through his descendants' lineage. In other words, church, it was, as a reminder, a massive honor. But Jacob takes the younger brother advantage of Esau, the older brother. You see, when Esau was physically exhausted, Jacob ends up going to him and offering a bowl of soup in exchange for his older brother's birthright. Esau ends up exchanging it. It is a dumb decision, but as we talked about in previous months, we can have compassion and empathy on older brother Esau. Why? Because just like him, he's been taken advantage of, and we could all relate. You see, uh, after he ends up stealing, Jacob steals his older brother's birthright, the next interaction between the two brothers is actually Jacob then going and taking away his blessing. The blessing was different from the birthright. Culturally, the blessing was a monumental time in a child's life. Uh, it was a prophetic word that was spoken from the father over his children. It pretty much told the future to the children as the father would prophesy. They were like verbal versions of what we would call written wills or living trusts. And Jacob, the younger brother, Again, steals that from his older brother Esau. But check this out. Rebecca was the one, their mom, who told the younger brother to do so. It was her plan. Okay, so being betrayed by your sibling is one thing, and that hurts. But then Esau has to deal with being betrayed by his mother. Rebecca did this, biblically, we find out, because she favored her younger son Jacob. And in today's text, we're going to make a quick read-through of the passage. We're going to follow Esau's reaction to all of these offenses from his brother to his mother. Let's get into the passage. I'm excited. Genesis 27, verse 41. From that time on, Esau hated Jacob because their father had given Jacob the blessing. And Esau began to scheme. I will soon be mourning my father's death. Then I will kill my brother Jacob. Esau is bitter and he is resentful because of the offense of his family. And as I said earlier, can we blame him? It's said all the time, and get, don't, don't get me wrong, I don't buy into every cultural saying, but hurt people really do hurt people. We got two people uh, who actually know that quote. Maybe it's not as popular as what I thought. <laughs> hurt people, hurt people. So Esau wants to kill his brother. Read with me the rest of the passage, verse 42. But Rebekah, mama, heard what Esau's plans were. So she sent for Jacob and told him, listen, Esau is conspiring himself to, to plotting to kill you. So listen carefully, my son. Get ready and flee to my brother. Interesting. Note with me, this is just a quick note, that the bitterness is described from Esau as consoling himself. It's a coping mechanism to a deeper hurt. Let's keep reading on. Verse 44, stay there, Rebecca says to the younger brother. 
Stay there with him until your brother cools off. Then, he cal- then when he calms down and forgets what you have done to him, I will send for you to come back. Note with me, she is equating, mama's equating forgetfulness with forgiving. And those two rarely mesh together. Just a note, let's continue to press on. Rebecca saying to her youngest son, lastly, why should I lose both of you in one day? Okay, funny side note, real quick, is that Rebecca, mama, ends up hearing for the second time in this chapter, she overhears plans. The first one was earlier where her husband was making a plan to bless Esau. Now she's hearing Esau planning to kill Jacob. In other words, mamas know what's going on in their household. It is the fact of life. Don't even try to hide it. I can testify, I can tell you stories, but it'd make you run off. We're gonna continue to press on. Jacob's going to run away. Younger brother, the offender, because Esau, who was offended, is coddling a grudge. Grudges, bitterness, resentment, anger, because of an offense, is this morning's message. Let's pray. Spirit of the living God, I know who I am in you. I know that you're the only one who can minister your truth to the hearer. I'm just here saying, use me. You've prepared my heart. You've prepared my mind. I have nothing to prove up here. I ain't going to perform. That's for sure. Thank you for pressing me into intimate times with you. Would you free your people today by the power of your Holy Spirit? In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, 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 amen. Holding a grudge is a topic genuinely that I could preach on every single week and every single week someone would feel conviction over their sin. Uh, The reason is because as long as there are people in the world, there will be offenses. As long as there are offenses, there will be grudges. And if there are grudges, there will be a need for forgiveness. A need for forgiveness. The fact is there are many of us whether we know it right now or will later in the service, who have been holding on to grudges. Uh, Some of us are uncomfortable just for the fact that you're sitting down right now, it may be your first time, and you already are aware of a grudge that you have been harboring. And there are varying reasons as to why we avoid dealing with a grudge. Varying reasons. Uh, One of them is that it's just easier to look aside and not have to go through confrontation or remembering the offense habitually. Another one genuinely is this kind of weird makeup that I've experienced before where it strangely comforts us to coddle our grudge. We feel justified in our resentment and we don't want to release the grudge for fear, for fear that it will minimize what was done to us. We're afraid that releasing the grudge will mean that the offense was of no consequence. And yet in the deepest of our hearts, whether anyone even knows about this grudge or not, we know that it was of significant consequence in our lives. Friend, I feel compelled by the Holy Spirit of God just to relay a message to you. And it's that the offense towards you was seen by God. And he felt sorrow and compassion towards you, regardless of what life has been like ever since. That's important for us to know. It is, church. But what is of equal importance is to make sure that what happened to us does not keep us in bondage. Uh, Grudge means, just so we have a working definition, to coddle feelings of bitterness, anger, or resentment from an offender, uh, where any time that we sit back and look at the situation, those strong feelings come back around, or any time that we're triggered by an offense from the same person, it comes back around. Child of God, 
that is no way to live. I, I know that we've normalized living with wounds and with grudges, but that's not God's best for us. Not even close. And in relational offenses, the key to all this is forgiveness. How many of us can give a hearty amen that Jesus died that we would continue to live in freedom? Amen. So the Holy Spirit, blessed be his name, empowers us to forgive others and keep on forgiving. That's the key. Even as more offenses come about. Why? Because the Holy Spirit reminds us that we have greater offenses towards God. And he gives us a godly sorrow continually about those offenses that would keep our hearts soft towards God and towards others. Church, did you know that we could actually begin the day with pre-forgiving people? Before that we would start our day, we would make up in our minds that we would forgive the offenses of those who would forgive us. The Lord's Prayer. It's called putting your mind on things above, hallelujah. And he gives us the empowerment, capacity, ability, and desire to do so. This AM, we're gonna hop back into the text, observe a couple things that will empower, catch this, our future decisions to forgive. Because if we don't, the result is bondage. And if we do, the result is freedom. Let's make a conscious decision today to live up to what all Jesus has bought for us. Amen? Let's get into the text. Verse 41, from that time on, Esau hated Jacob because their father had given Jacob the blessing. And Esau began to scheme, I will soon be mourning my father's death. Then, then, I will kill my brother Jacob. Esau schemed, he plotted, he thought methodically about retaliation. In other words, he made plans for his grudge. He coddled it and purposely thought on it to a point where he made plans for his grudge. In Leviticus 19, God ends up saying this, do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone among your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Bear a grudge in this text is a single word in the Hebrew, natach which means to guard or cherish anger. The idea is that we hold on to grudges and it's like coddling a baby. The baby is the grudge and we guard it like we would guard our infants. We also cherish a grudge like we do a newborn, practically. We do this by defending our right to hold on to the offense. Practically, we do this by unconsciously feeling safe, being a victim instead of going to God, confessing it, looking to him for forgiveness, restoration, and purpose. We purposely and practically do this by minimizing the grudge, as I alluded to earlier. We don't think about it. We don't deal with it because it's just, it is just easier. And here's the thing, church. We will always coddle our grudges if we do not forgive the offender. That's right. You can't just sweep it under the rug. Come on now. It will have devastating consequences. Child of God, look with me in the text. Let's get into it. Verse 42, but Rebecca, the mom, heard about Esau's plan, so she went for Jacob and told him, listen, Esau's consoling himself by plotting to kill you, so listen carefully, my son. Get ready and flee to my brother Laban in Haran. Stay there with him until your brother cools off. When he calms down and forgets what you have done to him, I will send for you to come back. Why? Here it is. Why should I lose both of my sons in one day? Grudges break up families. And friendships. It is a sad scene. A mother has to tell her son that he needs to run away because his brother is planning to kill him. And what makes it even more sad is the context around it. 
Rebecca never sees her son Jacob, who she sends off ever again. It will be 20 years later until Jacob returns, the offender, to make amends with the offended, his brother Esau. And during those 20 years, Mama Rebecca dies. Life moves on. This family is fractured, yes, because the offender showed no remorse. Jacob, younger brother, showed no remorse for what he did. But even more so, because the offended, Esau, was coddling a grudge. Church, our private grudges have public effect. This... And I get, don't get me wrong, I get that we are supposed to overlook sin. The word of God says so. It's to our glory and to the glory of God if we can overlook sin. But there are times when it's gone too far and we have coddled the grudge to where it has a bitter root. And at that point, you can't overlook it. You have to examine your own heart, as the psalmist would say. And you have to uproot that bad boy. So you would break free from bondage in Jesus' name. Don't fool ourselves from thinking, church, that we can just overlook a true grudge. It will affect us. Not can, will affect us. Hebrews 12 verse 15 warns us of this. Watch out that no poisonous root of bitterness grows up to trouble you. Here it is, corrupting many. Let me address those of you who are coddling a grudge against family. The word says that it is poison to you. And here's what's worse. It's poison to your family's soul when we coddle grudges. Holding a grudge is like drinking poison and then wanting your offender to die. It really is consequential church the enemy has a massive target on each of our family's backs god created quick teaching family to be one of four departments in his designed will where his will would be done the others are church government and then individual self-governance but here's the tricky thing that we would all say an amen to within the family it is the easiest to get offended why closest relationships the easiest with familiarity breeding contempt we're going to move forward don't let what's happening in your heart right now leave we're going to jump back into the text and see the last thing today about coddling a grudge we're going to jump now literally 13 chapters from this very scene Jacob will have 12 sons. So this is now taking Jacob's story. He's going to have 12 sons, one of which, whose name is Joseph. Joseph is betrayed by his brothers. He was beaten. They were jealous of him. He was left for dead. He then survives. He's then imprisoned unjustly. In other words, Joseph, the son of Jacob, could have coddled many offenses towards his brothers for his hard life. And in this passage, we'll read the brother's apology years after the fact where they left him for dead. Genesis 50, 15. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, what if Joseph holds a grudge against us and pays us back for all the wrongs we did to him? So they sent word to Joseph saying, your father left these instructions. I mean, it's him. It's not us. Uh, Before he died, he said, this is what you have to say to Joseph. I ask you to forgive your brothers the sins and the wrongs they committed in treating you so badly. And then the brothers look, what I would imagine is in their brother's eye, Joseph, and they say this. Now please forgive the sins of your servants, us brothers, of the God of your father. And look at the reaction. When their message came to him, Joseph wept. What a beautiful picture of a forgiven heart. One that's experienced the healing ministry of God. Let's read on. Verse 18, his brothers then came and threw themselves down before him. We are your slaves, they said. Now pay attention to what happens 
to Joseph in his response right here, verse 19. But Joseph said to them, don't be afraid. This is his response. Don't be afraid, brothers, who threw me into prison, threw me and my life away in a ditch to be killed. Don't be afraid. Am I in place of God? In other words, Joseph saying, I'm not going to retaliate. That's God's job. He will just rightly and make everything right. Joseph realized, and here it is, church, that holding a grudge puts you in power over your offender to where you have a decision of lording it over them. If we don't forgive our offender, we will be massively tempted to weaponize our offense. And I don't trust myself. I hope you don't trust you. We trust Christ in us. We will be tempted to manipulate the offender and perception from those who know the situation. Church, when we withhold forgiveness from our offender, we think that we're punishing them. But in reality, we're imprisoning us. We think that we are punishing the offender by holding the grudge, but we're really imprisoning us, imprisoning us to the jail cell of bitterness, anger, or resentment. And here's the key, church. The key is that only forgiveness can free us. Only forgiveness. The good news on top of that is our, our offender does not have the power to free us. We do. Bless the Lord. We can actually unlock that cell of a grudge, bitterness, anger, and walk out ourselves from the inside out. It happens by our willingness to forgive regardless of the reaction or actions or the remorse or lack thereof of our offender. And church, that, that is an indicator that we truly have been healed. The fact that we don't need an apology. Some of us, honestly, I have confession here, some of us want that apology from our offender. But it may never happen. But boy... It would feel good, wouldn't it? It would feel good to hear, I'm sorry, from the offender. You got to ask why. I love, I stinking love the word of God. It always proves itself true. Why is that sentiment true? Proverbs 18, verse 21. The tongue has the power of life and death. Hearing our offenders repent from their offenses can bring life and freedom. We can't even lie to ourselves. It'll bring it to our souls. And right now, I want to make that a possibility and make room for the Holy Spirit to minister to your hearts, potentially making a decision to forgive. I want to give you an opportunity now to actually have a joyful, weeping response just like Joseph did as he heard his brothers apologize. A female, male, and spiritual representative will now come up here and represent a female, male, and spiritual leader who may have offended you, whom you may be coddling a grudge against. You may be thinking to yourself that I've had a person, I've imagined the whole sermon. Some of you may be thinking, I have no one. And the Holy Spirit, as you listen in, will reveal what he needs to. They're going to read apologies from a sorrowful heart. Let's call it representative confession. It's a biblical principle found in Nehemiah's prayer in chapter one of his book, and then Daniel's prayer in chapter nine of his book. You can look at this at your own time, they confessed their sins as prophets and then asked for God's mercy. The representative here will do the same now. 
they're gonna confess sins that may resonate in your heart with someone who offended you and then ask you for mercy. Note, this is for you, not your offender. Their offense towards you has to be dealt with between them and God for God to extend forgiveness towards them. This is for you and your own heart to be clean before God and to experience true forgiveness. My prayer is that you would receive these words as a healing balm to your soul. Heidi will go ahead and kick us off. That might help, right? Okay. You know, I just want to say one thing before I start reading these apologies. There's not one person in the house today that hasn't had their heart wounded. Some of you here are, like Pastor was saying, is just holding on to this. But our sweet Jesus is here today right beside you prompting you to just say let go for his burden is so light that yoke that you're carrying was never meant for you to carry and you are serving the most precious precious father that loves his children to the depth of their being oh he'll still love you if you hold on to the grudge but he's beckoning you into a new light, a new level with him. And if I could just have everyone just close their eyes, because I want these words, take your eyes off of who's standing in front of you. This is between you and Abba Father. And I just want to read these as a woman standing humbly before you, asking you to forgive me in the wrongs as the woman in your life. As a friend, I'm sorry for the hurt I caused you. I'm sorry for making you feel unimportant and keeping you out of the loop. I'm sorry for gossiping about you, for offending you, for leaving you out of our group, for not valuing our friendship for simply letting you down. Please forgive me. As a woman in authority, possibly a teacher, coach, or boss, I'm sorry for abusing my authority over you, for allowing my insecurities to get in the way of encouraging you. I'm sorry for demeaning you rather than treating you like a valued member of the team. I was wrong for preserving my power and status rather than helping you flourish. I was wrong for using you, for thinking of you as a lower than myself. Please forgive me. As a sister, I'm sorry for choosing others over you while we were growing up and for the many times you took the blame for my wrongdoing. I'm sorry for mistreating you and for making you feel like I was always the favored one. I'm sorry for not even knowing you very well. Now that we are adults, I'm so sorry for not pursuing a relationship with you and your family, for missing your children's birthdays and not celebrating their successes. Please. Forgive me for my selfly, selfishness. I have been so wrong. As a mother, I'm sorry for arguing and yelling that you heard in the night. I'm sorry for the things you heard me say.
to your dad and about your dad. I'm sorry for the deliver the divorce and I want to tell you now my sweet child that was not your fault I'm sorry for neglecting you for not protecting you and not believing you at times I'm sorry for how you had to take care of me for putting you in the role of parent and me becoming the child. I'm sorry for controlling and manipulating you. I'm sorry for putting guilt and shame on you, for criticizing you. I'm sorry for judging you. I'm sorry for all the names and the labels I put on you that were out of my own insecurities and anger. You are not these things. I'm sorry for trying to form you into the image of what I thought you should be. I'm sorry for blaming you for all the things that have gone wrong in my own life. I'm sorry for embarrassing you in front of your friends and for putting you down. But hear my heart this day. I have not said this often enough. I am so proud of you. I'm proud to call you my child. And I love you. My heart is breaking because now I see the pain I have caused you. I have been so very wrong. Please forgive me. here with a humble heart to recognize and acknowledge what I have done to you. I'm here in my role to ask for your forgiveness for the wrongs that I have committed against you. As a boss, coach, teacher, as a man in authority, I'm sorry for abusing the power of my position, for treating you like a servant rather than a co-worker and a valued member of the team. I'm sorry for using you and for acting as if you were lower than me. I abused my position of power to make myself look good. I am sorry for not recognizing your effort, your contribution, and your achievement. I was more concerned with my own success than helping you succeed. I was wrong. Please forgive me. As a friend, I'm sorry for the hurt I caused you, for not being there for you when I said I would. I apologize for things I said and did that caused you to feel that you were not my friend. I apologize for not caring enough to respond to you. I'm sorry for mistreating you, for the disrespect I showed you. I was not being a Christian brother to you, and did not honor the way, honor you the way I should. Please forgive me, I was wrong. As a brother, I'm sorry for not respecting you as my sibling. I'm sorry for prioritizing my friends over you. I'm sorry for neglecting you and for shaming you by not including you among my friends. I'm sorry for calling you names for looking down on you, and for the times I did not stand up for you like a brother should. I'm sorry for saying that I hate you. When I said I wished you were not part of the family, I was wrong. 
I am so sorry that I was a bad example for you and did not live up to the calling that the Lord had on my life. I'm sorry that I used you for the ways I mistreated you. My abuse toward you that caused you so much pain in your life was wrong. I was wrong. I am so sorry for not loving you as a brother should. Please forgive me. And as a father, I'm sorry I wasn't there for you. I'm so sorry that my work <clears throat> and image were more important than you and the activities you were involved in. I'm sorry for missing the events that were important to you and for not being interested in the things you cared about. I'm sorry for abandoning you. Forgive me for being so selfish and caring more about my needs than yours. I'm sorry for the names I called you when I was upset and angry. I'm sorry for making fun of you in front of your friends. I'm so sorry for the abuse. You did not deserve any of it. I was so wrong to hurt you in that way. Please forgive me. I'm sorry for divorcing your mom and turning my back on you. The divorce was not your fault. I'm sorry that I withdrew from you and did not provide you with a sense of security and safety at home. I'm sorry that I never said I love you, that I didn't tell you how proud I am of you. My heart breaks to see how I have hurt you and how I did not fulfill the role of father in your life the way God wanted me to. I am so sorry. It was not your fault. I alone am responsible for my words and actions that caused you pain. I'm sorry for trying to control you and for emotionally distancing myself when things did not go my way. I was wrong. And by the way, I am proud of you. I know I don't say it enough, but I am proud of you. Please forgive me. I come in confession and repentance as one who's been in positions of spiritual leadership in your life. Church, if you wouldn't mind just closing your eyes for focus purposes. Either a children's pastor, volunteer, youth leader, youth pastor, or senior pastor, I want you to know how deeply sorry I am. I've been wrong in so many areas and repent before you in the presence of the Lord. I take ownership and am sorry for the ways I did not shepherd you and protect you or your family. Did not lead you through the dark days or failed to be there when you were hurting and in pain. I'm, I'm sorry and repent for making you feel unwelcome and un unwanted in God's house being preoccupied and busy. I'm sorry for all the fear I caused in your heart because of my setting a standard that I couldn't even keep myself but required you to keep. I repent of failing to keep your confidence which resulted in people turning away from you, pulling away from your family. I repent for all the times I manipulated you and your family with legalistic and controlling comments. I, I was operating in fear rather than in love. I own and repent of asking you to volunteer and serve more than I was willing to give myself. And it cost you much. I, I repent for failing to call or visit in your time of need. Forgive me for abandoning you after forming a meaningful relationship with you and then allowing my overcommitments, my sin to take priority over you and shepherding you. I'm sorry for the cruel and mean way I treated you and your family when you guys let us know that it was your time to leave. 
I should have celebrated what God was doing in you and prayed blessing over you as you moved on to the next assignment. But instead, I judged you, condemned you, drove you away without blessing. I harmed you and your family by doing this. Forgive me, please. I'm sorry for misrepresenting God's character to you, for taking advantage of you. As a representative of all the spiritual leaders you have had, please forgive me. In church right now, as your eyes are closed, right now, I want you to envision if there truly is a grudge you have against anyone who was read about, picture them in your mind right now. If you are willing forgive them. If you are willing to let go of the burden and free yourself from imprisonment from the inside, if you're ready for that, I just want you to say or in your thought life, I forgive you and fill in their name. Church, can you give me your eyes for a moment? If you forgave anyone in this house in the past 20 minutes, just remember that you forgave them regardless of their true remorse. There may be future offenses that come from them towards you. The enemy will tempt us to grapple for that grudge again. And it's at that moment, church, you remember this moment today that you forgave that person regardless of their remorse. Now, we're going to sing the last set of worship songs, the last two songs to end our time. The ministry team is going to come up and they're going to align themselves right in front of the altar. You are invited to come up at any time during the worship set. These male and females are your forever family siblings in Christ. They are here to pray blessing over you, encourage you, give a hug, cry with them, celebrate the decision you may have given to forgive someone or to process any questions that you have. If you have any thought or desire to do so right now or during worship, don't overthink it. It's the Holy Spirit of God wanting to minister further healing for you. The one thing that will keep us from coming up and experiencing the closure of freedom today, at least for today, is our pride our ego, not wanting to look weak, but this is the house of God. If we can't be weak here, where else can we be weak? We are for one another, amen? These are your people, they're here for you. So if God's spirit's leading during that time, come up, talk with anyone during the ministry team. And last thing, before we get into it, for my friend who has never given their life to Jesus, you can truly forgive others, but it's when you've been truly forgiven by your creator. Before we go on forgiving others, God wants to forgive you, just as he did me 15 years ago. He wants you to ask him to forgive Give yourself from running your life independent from him to operating in selfishness to not allowing your creator to rightly guide you and when you do so he will restore you back to the freedom you were meant to live in Jesus name if that's your heart desire come up during that time my friend we're going to be singing songs. You can let our ministry team know that is you and they will love to guide you back to your creator. Don't wait. This could be the moment 
that you've been waiting for all your life.